Bibles, I would, I would encourage you to find uh, the Gospel of Luke, find that. And uh, for the past number of weeks, we've been going through a sermon series in, in this Gospel, looking through it. And so this morning, we're at the beginning of, of chapter 7, and we're going to be looking at the first 10 verses that we have there. And it's just a quick reminder of, of what's, what's just happened. We saw a lot of this in, in chapter 6. Uh, Jesus has just finished preaching this sermon, this long uh, message. It took us about four weeks or so, five weeks to, to go through. Um, and so we looked at, at this message this past, these past few weeks, and he's been, there's a lot of people that are now around Jesus, right? So they, they've heard about his healings. They've heard about the things that he is doing, the things that he is teaching. So there's crowds and crowds of people that are, that are gathering around him. Some, some believe that it could have been in, in, in the thousands of people. So there's this massive group of people and then it's interesting, in this, in this wide spectrum of people that are gathering with Jesus, you know, he on, on one side, he had, he had those that were, that were just committed to him. You know, those that say, man, I, I believe in what you're saying. I, I, I'm, I'm in Jesus because I've seen you do these things. I, I'm in. And on the other side, he had people that were just really more, more there out of curiosity, right? Just there because, man, they, they haven't heard anybody talk like this or do these things. And then, but they're, they're, they're maybe not buying it, but they're, they're curious, right? And they... And then a whole spectrum of people in the middle. And so that made up this group of people that are following Jesus around. And so he had been talking to this crowd of people who, to, to one degree or another, were, were interested in what, what he had to say and maybe interested in who, who, who he was. And so in, in this sermon, what he tells them uh, is essentially, in the, that we looked at, is, is what a disciple really is. And that was essentially his message. What it means to be a follower of him to be a follower of Jesus. And he teaches about that, but he, and this is, this is what he wanted this crowd to know. And again, some of them were, were yeah, Jesus, we, we know, and we're, we're in, we're going to buy into this. And others were like, I'm not ready to do that yet. But that was what he was teaching. So now we come to this passage this morning, chapter 7. He's finished this message, and that's kind of the context for that. So he's finished this this morning. And so just to give you a heads up, there's a key word that I want you to pay attention to that, I, that just jumped out at me. And I think we're going to spend a lot of time looking at it this morning. And you're going to see it in our passage. And that's the word worthy. What, what does it mean to be worthy? I mean, that's the question. What do you think of when you hear the word worthy? It's the problem I think that we have or that a lot of people may have is that we come to this text or we come to our own um, conclusions, but what we think the word worthy means. And a lot of times the word that we think it means or the way we define it is different than how it's defined in Scripture, how, it's, how we see it in here. So uh, as we read this passage this morning, we need to maybe have our, our definitions of how we define this word change. We need to be open to that. And I think what we're going to find, though, is, we, is once we define this, this differently, we see how the Bible does it. It's not just how we look at the word, this word, and, and, and it, how it changes and how we define it, but the way we live should change as well, because it all flows out of this. See, this is the, the beautiful thing about, about the word of God, is that when we read it, when we understand it, it begins to change us, begins to work in our heart. And there's a change that happens when we do that. God's word can change us. And what the author of the book of Hebrews actually tells us that he tells us that the word of God is, is living and active. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that. You can, the passage is on the screen, but this is a, a beautiful thing about God's word. And so when we come to it, we, we should expect for it to change us. That's what God can do. And so let's come to this passage and this book knowing that it can and it should change us. It should change our hearts. So let's listen to our, our passage this morning uh, again, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10 after. We're done listening through it. And you can follow along on the screen or you can follow along on your, on your take-home sheet. If you have a Bible, you can, you can follow along there as well. So let's listen to it after it's done. I'll come back up and we'll, we'll pray together and we'll, we'll dig in. So let's listen to our passage. Reading from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, 
He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for this passage and for, for what it, it can teach us. God, would you just open up our our eyes and our hearts to understand what you have for us this morning. Would we, would we see this, God? Would we just behold you and be reminded about just how good and awesome you are? Amen. So let's start off by looking back or looking at, at verse 1. And this kind of gives us the context about uh, what, what is happening. Uh, verse 1 says, after he's finished all these things, as Jesus had finished his, his sermon, the Sermon on the Plain, and he's finishing that. And then he, so it says, after he finished all his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. So this story that we're going to look back takes place right after he's finished this message. But he says something in verse 1 that I think we, we need just to catch and need to understand. It says, when he finished all his sayings in the hearing of his people. And this is interesting because we've looked at this, this word before uh, a few times already, right? He's used us a few times, the word, the word hear, right? In, in chapter 6, uh, verse 27, that's, that's not on the screen, but in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 27, he said these words, he says, but, but to you who, who hear, and then a few verses later in verse 47, he says, um, and hears my words and does them, right? So throughout this sermon that, that Jesus gave, this, this message, this, this, this passage that he's been talking about, He's been giving, he's been calling all of his disciples, all of this crowd, the people around him, to not just listen to what he is saying, not just listen, not just to hear what he says, but to be hearers of what he is calling them. To actually have, have ears to hear what he is saying. And I think this is something that Luke just puts in here at the very beginning of, of this passage, just to remind us of the call, not just to hear what he is saying, but to, but to also listen, to pay attention, to be hearers of this. And so he says at the beginning, after he'd finished all these sayings in the hearing of his people. So wanting these people to, to, to listen to what he is saying. So after Jesus finished the message with the people listening uh, and what he's telling them about, he enters Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was really close to where Jesus was. You know, he could just walk to it. It was a very short, short distance away. Uh, Capernaum was a, was a busy city at the time, right? It was, it was in the north of the, the Sea of Galilee. If you looked at a map, you, you would see it there. It was surrounded by, by hills, and there was a lot of things that were growing on these hills. So it was an agricultural kind of place as well. Then, but Jesus made a lot of his, his stops in Capernaum. It was kind of like his, his headquarters, his main uh, stop where he'd come to during his ministry. Right? He, would, he would travel around the area preaching and teaching and, and doing things and visiting towns and villages. And then when he came back home, it tended to be at Capernaum you know, for much of the time. So this is where, where Jesus is going to. So he heads to this place. So let's pick that up in verses 2 and 3. In verses 2 and 3, it says, it says this. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. So a centurion. A centurion is a, is a commander of the, the Roman army. Anybody guess a centurion? How many men would he be in command of if it's a centurion? A hundred, yes. You guys are very smart people. 100, it's from the word century, right? So a uh, centurion was in charge of about 100 men, give or take a few, right? And it's, it was an important position, right, given to those that, that worked their way up the ranks, right? These men had earned it. These men were, were usually battle-tested, right? They were soldiers. 
that, that knew how to fight, right? They, were, they had courage and bravery and fortitude and strength. All of these things you think about when you think of a, a soldier. But to be a soldier in ancient times was so different than it is today, right? It was a, a dangerous job. It was hand-to-hand combat. That's what it meant to be a soldier there, right? You didn't have a, a tank to sit in or, you know, hide behind somewhere and launch a missile that goes three miles away. You didn't do kind of that kind of thing. You fought hand-to-hand. And so soldiers then were intimidating men, right? They didn't get that way, you know, without knowing how to fight and how to lead. They knew how to lead. They knew how to set an example. They knew how to fight. They knew how to command. They, they had strength and courage and, and manliness. That's is what a, a soldier was. And so that's the picture we have of a centurion. We hear the word centurion. We should think about this, this kind of a man. It's a man's man. That's the person that we're dealing with. So a centurion, we're told, has a, has a slave, has a, has a servant. And I'm sure many of them had these servants, these slaves that, 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 they, that they had. And back then, a, a servant was, was property to them, right? It was an actual person. It was seen as property. So that you could do whatever you wanted to this servant, right? If you wanted to beat him, you were allowed to do that. If he, you know, did something wrong that you didn't like, you actually were allowed to kill him if you wanted to. That's how servants were treated. They were property. But we're told that this servant was really valuable to this centurion. Now, we're not told what he did, why he was so valuable, but we're, whatever he did, but he was highly valued. He was really important. So much so that when he gets sick, this, sin, this uh, servant gets sick to the point of death, right? And the centurion had seen death before, I'm sure, being in the battles. I'm sure he knew what death was and what it looked like. So he knows that this servant of his is close to dying. It's death. And instead of just saying, well, whatever, he's just a slave anyway, or, or saying, ah, it's not that important, right? He does something that's totally unexpected for a position, for a person in this kind of a position. We're told in verse 3 that he, that he hears about Jesus. So he sends Jewish leaders, Jewish elders, to ask Jesus to come and to heal his servant. Now, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but right now, I just want to, I want to stop right here. I think this is our first clue that we get that there's something different about this centurion. Look at what he does here. By sending someone to come and to heal his servant, he wants his servant healed. He is, in a sense, serving his servant. He's serving his servant, the the one who is supposed to look after him, do whatever he says. He now is valuing the servant so much that he's, he's going out of his way to serve his own servant. He's calling for help. And there are other stories that we can read about in in the Gospels where people send uh, or they go to Jesus on the behalf of somebody else. It happens. People do this. But the times that we read about it in Scripture, it's always for like a son or or a daughter or or themselves. They're calling out, Jesus, come and save my son. Come save my daughter. You got to do this or save me. We don't ever read about someone saying, come and heal my servant. It's different. Again, there's something different that's happened with this centurion. This is a a unique story. But we're told that he he has heard about Jesus. That somebody at, at some point has told this man about Jesus. And as we keep looking at this passage, I think that we're going to see that somebody has told him a lot about Jesus. So the news of Jesus and what he could do had, had, had spread quickly, right? So a lot of people had been hearing about it. Look what it says back in, in chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 14, right? Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through the surrounding country. Verse 37, and reports about him went into every place in the surrounding region. So word had, had traveled fast, even in the day without social media or cell phones or, or news networks, right? Word was spreading really quickly. Now, everywhere that Jesus was going, there was crowds that were gathering, right? He was healing people. He was casting out 
demons and he was teaching people about the, the kingdom of God and nobody had, you know, had ever heard or seen anything like this before. And this happened everywhere he went. So naturally the centurion got, got word of Jesus. But I think someone actually told him the specific details about who Jesus was. And so look who he sends to heal, or look who he sends to Jesus to come and heal his servant. It says he sends Jewish elders. These were, these were leaders in the, in the Jewish church. And this is a, an amazing statement that, that, that Jews or even elders would be willing to help out a Roman, a Roman soldier. If you think about those dynamics, the Jews, Jews hated the Romans and their occupation of their country. Man, they didn't want them there. They were, they were annoying to have this, this, this group of people here. They wanted freedom from the Romans. They were their occupation of it. But here, this, this Roman has got a relationship with the Jewish people, so he actually sends them to go on his behalf. Right? So he sends these Jewish leaders to ask. The word ask that we see here is, is the word behind it, meaning it's like this, this begging or, or pleading. This is what he wants them to do, to beg Jesus, to, to plead with Jesus to come and to heal his servants. So he asks them to go ahead and do that. Again, another sign that there's something different about this centurion. There's something different about him, way different than his other fellow Romans or other, or other Roman soldiers. We just continue to get this picture of a man who's not a typical soldier, not a typical person who has servants. This is a man who, who loves his servant. Right? And he knows that there's someone who can come and heal the servant, so, and he's desperate. So he says, just, just plead with Jesus. Tell him, tell him he has to come. He has to come and heal my servant. Let's keep reading verses 4 and 5. Let's continue. It goes on and it says, And when, when they came to Jesus, they, they pleaded with him earnestly. This is the word. This is what they asked of him, right? So he said, go and ask him. That's that word. Go plead with him. And so the Jewish elders go and they plead with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation and he is the one who built us our synagogue. Right? So they come to Jesus and they are, are pleading with Jesus to come. And it must have been a, just a crazy scene to see. Here we have Jewish elders explaining to Jesus why he should help this Gentile Roman soldier. See, these Jewish elders have become the centurion's unlikely advocate, pleading this case on his behalf, right? And they lay out the reasons as to why Jesus should come, right? It's, it's like telling him, so it's, it's telling him that, you know, they, they don't appeal to, to his, uh, his compassion. That's not in their, in their reason. That's not what they do. They could have done that. They could have appealed to, to Jesus as a compassion. They would have maybe known that he was a compassionate person, but they don't do that. Instead, that they try and show other reasons why Jesus should come. And something that I find just interesting is that in this account, what they have to say, how they try to convince Jesus to come and heal this servant, they don't talk at all about the servant. They don't mention any. It is, he says, you got to do this because his master is worthy. It's nothing about the servant, but it's about all about the centurion and what kind of person he is, not about the one who actually is sick. There's something interesting about that. But look at, look at what they have to say about why Jesus should come. Because the man that sent him, because he is worthy. Now, if you're somebody that likes to underline and highlight stuff in your Bibles, this is a good word to circle, underline, or highlight. It's, it's that word, Worthy, And we're going to see this word come up again in, our, in this passage. So the main reason that they have is as to why Jesus should come to this person because their master is worthy. Because this man is worthy. That's the reason. So what makes someone worthy? See, these Jewish elders actually tell us why they think he is worthy. They give Two reasons. The first one is that he loves our nation. 
And the second is that he built the synagogue. So this Roman centurion, this army commander, we're told, loves the nation of Israel. A nation that he was there to, to keep in line. Right? A nation filled with people that wanted, that wanted him and his government gone. This really is incredible because, I mean, it's basically just saying, like, saying it like it was, right? The Jews hated the Romans and vice versa, but this man loved this nation. It wasn't that he just loved a few of them or had some good friends that, were, that happened to be Jews, you know, had some favorites, but we're told, the elders say he loves the nation. He loved the people of God. And by the word, the word love here that we see is that Greek word agapeo. It's like the highest and, and richest form of love in the Greek language. He loved them with this highest and this best kind of love. Right? Not, not, not the passionate love, not the emotional love, but the love of the will, of the understanding, the love of knowledge. And he loved the whole people, which likely means that he understood something about the place of Israel in the plan of God. That they were God's chosen people. I think he understood that. So he came to love the people of God. Not only does he love the people of God, does he love that nation, but he gave money to build a synagogue. And the indication is that, that he alone did that. So he was wealthy. So he gave all the money to build this place of worship. Right? A place where they were taught scriptures. So here's a man. Again, let's look at this centurion who goes against the grain of the Roman attitude. First off, he loves his slave. Loves his slave. He loves the nation that he's supposed to be against, be keeping in line. He loves that nation that he's supposed to be against. And by, by doing this, he's doing exactly what Jesus taught. If we look back at the Sermon on the Plain that Jesus just gave not too long ago, one of the things that Jesus talked about was loving your enemies. Here's a man who does that. He's loving his enemies. More and more, it starts to reveal to us that this unnamed centurion is just not the average Roman soldier. So because of that, because of his love for this nation, because of how he built the synagogue, all these things, the Jewish elders say, man, he's worthy. So Jesus, you got to come do this because of all the things that he has done. And right here, it's such a good um, insight into the beliefs of the, of the Jews. Right? Their whole system was based on, on, worthly, on worthly, worthiness, on being worthy. Right? They thought he was worthy, and they thought so you know, because of all these things that he has done. Right? And so because of that, Jesus then ought to do something for him. He has done enough. Right? So he has earned something. That was the Jewish system. It was all about merit. It was all about personal worthiness, personal worth, which therefore earns you the right to some kind of a divine favor. That was the Jewish system, right? They thought they were worthy for God to take them into his kingdom, right? Because of their self-righteousness, their, their ceremonial observances. They thought this guy was worthy too because of what he had done and, and who he loved. So as if they were saying to Jesus right there, you, you know, you servant of God, you, you, you prophet of God, however they, they thought about him, they're saying, you owe him this. You owe him this because of all the things that he has done. That was their system. That's what, what they thought. Now, before we start thinking, man, that's crazy. Like, who, who thinks that way? Because I think we have a tendency to think that when we, when we read Scripture, to think, were the Jews that blind? Did they, did they not see it? How, how could they think this way? No, but I, I think if we think about it, I think our understanding is we've, we have a lot of that in our system, in our, in our culture as well. We, I think we think the same way too. Right? We always think that, man, I, I, I deserve that for what I did. Why didn't someone do that for me? Because I look at all these good things that I've done. And maybe even with, with Jesus, we have this tendency to think about that. To think about all the good things that we do for God maybe, for his kingdom, Think that now, now he owes me something. I'm going to get into this 
a little, a little bit at the end. But even, even this tendency that we have you know, with this word worthy, you know, when somebody wins an award or something, it's, they're often described as being just a worthy recipient, right? We use that word because of something they have done to win this award made them worthy. There's a, an amazing movie, set of movies out there, uh, The Avengers. Have you ever watched The Avengers movies? There's a, there's a character in The Avengers whose name is, is Thor. And some of you maybe know where I'm going with this already, but Thor had a, had a hammer that he, that he wielded. And uh, he wielded this hammer because he was worthy. As the movies tell us that he was, he was worthy, that nobody else actually was able to, to use this hammer. In fact, nobody could even pick up this hammer because nobody was worthy to, ye- to wield this, this hammer. So he was the only one. So all these movies that it goes through until like the last movie. And until, like this is honestly probably the, the greatest, and I say this on, on the greatest cinematic scene in movie history. I kid you not. So there's this battle. And like they, they got this massive battle. All these heroes are battling Thanos and his minions. And it doesn't look good. And it looks nasty. And then all of a sudden, um, Thor's hammer is flying through the air. And Captain America sticks out his hand. And he grabs Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, and he is able to wield it. He too was worthy, and he takes it, and they just destroy the enemy. And it is incredible. And I, honestly, I saw that live. Not live. I saw that in the theater. The whole theater just erupted in applause. It was absolutely incredible. Like I said, greatest cinematic scene in movie history that we now knew, and we knew it the whole time, that, that Captain America was also worthy We thought so too. So this was all based on who was worthy to yield the hammer. And actually years ago, our family went went to Disneyland and we waited in line and we actually got to meet Thor. He was right there. And uh, it was just our family. And he had had his hammer there and he asked one of our boys, I forget who it was, to come up and to to pick up the hammer. And they, they, they tried with all their might and they could not budge. But Thor just reached down and picked it up. And he posed with a picture with our family. We got a picture of us with Thor. So cool. See, when it comes, though, to being worthy now in, in this life, you know, many of us think that that same way, that we think, man, we, we deserve it. All these things that we've done, right? We, we deserve this or we deserve that, right? All because of what we did. So that, that thinking is no different than what the elders thought, Right? This is where we need to change in how we define what it means to be worthy. And this is something we're going to see in a bit, but let's just keep going. Let's look at verse 6. We'll just do one more verse. Um, and Jesus went with them, and when he was not far off from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Okay. So Jesus is now coming. He's making his way. The elders, I guess, have convinced him enough. So he's coming. And as he gets, gets close, so there's likely this big crowd that is following around, right? And they, they want to see what's, what's going to happen in this, right? They, they want to see. There's, they like a good show. And so the centurion can maybe, maybe hear or see the crowd in the distance coming close. And so now at this time, he, he, sends, he sends friends to go talk to Jesus, right? And so look at the message that he gives them now to tell Jesus, his message essentially is don't, don't come. Like, don't, don't come close. Because why? Because I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even have you come into my, my house. And you can just see the, the contrast here, right? With what the elders thought of him, how they thought he was worthy compared to with what, how he thought of himself. Now, his words here can be a bit confusing, Right? Because, yeah, didn't he actually send the Jewish elders to come to his house? Yeah, he did, right? We see that in, um, in verse 3, right? He sent the elders, the Jews, asking them to come to him and to heal his servant. But now he's saying, actually, don't, don't come. So what, what happened here? What, what, what changed in that, in that short time? Now, we don't know for certain, but looking at it, 
at his reason for not wanting Jesus to come to his house, it seems that I think the more he thought about Jesus showing up at his house, the more he realized just who Jesus was and who, who he was, right? And we, we have the sense throughout this passage that this centurion has, has some understanding of who Jesus is. And I think as he saw Jesus approaching, man, he just knew, man, I, 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 I can't do this. I'm not worthy to have him come. So he finally says, you, you got to stop. You know, he sends his friends to tell him, he, to tell him he's got to stop that he can't come to my house. So you can't come here. I, I am not worthy. This is similar to what Peter said in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, right? They caught this, this massive group of fish. This is when he, when he was calling Peter, uh, Luke chapter 5. And he, and he says this in, in verse, verse 8, when, when Simon Peter saw him, he fell down at Jesus' knees and just saying, depart from me, right? It's like, like, you can't, don't come close to me because of that, because of who I am, for I'm a, I'm a sinful man. And so I, I, I see this, almost the same thing happening with this centurion, recognizing who he is and who Jesus was. So you guys, there's something that happens in our hearts. There's something that happens when we understand and when we see Jesus for who he really is, right? When, we, when our eyes are open and our minds come to understand who Jesus really is, then we start to see what, who we are. We see our condition, our, our depravity, right? Our, our sinfulness, and we know that we're not worthy. I think this is what's happening with the centurion, that he just realized, I am not worthy. I know who he is, and I know who I am. Let's keep going. Verses 7 and 8, uh, they say this. Therefore, I did not presume to come, to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So the centurion recognizes the authority that Jesus has, right? He, he had authority too. He knew what it was like to have authority, but he knew that Jesus' authority was different, right? Jesus had authority to heal. He knew that. That's what he's saying here. And so through his friends, he's just saying, like, you don't even have to come to my house. Because of your authority, I know who you are. Like, you can just say it. You can just speak it and my servant will be healed with just a word, because I know who you are. I know the power you have. Just, just think about that statement that this centurion makes. Here's a man, right? He's not a Jew. He's an occupier, if you want to call him that. But he understands that the word of Jesus is absolutely authoritative. The miracles, the healings, all the things that Jesus has done, they weren't, they weren't magic. They weren't some tricks or, you know, sleight of hand. They were all done, right? Because authority, all authority and in heaven and in earth had been given to him. He knew this. He knew who Jesus was, the real Jesus. That's why he's saying, just speak. Just, just say it and it'll be so. Just, just say the word and I know my servant would be healed. Yeah, the centurion had heard about what Jesus could do. He'd heard the stories about the other teachings and the other miracles. That, and it tells us in verse 3, right? He knows he'd heard about Jesus, but what is more than just what he understands about Jesus? It's more than just some superficial information about the power of Jesus to heal. It was more, his knowledge of Jesus was more than that. See, somewhere along the line, someone told him about really who Jesus was. It, that's, it's the only explanation to get to this point, that somebody told him about who, who Jesus was. And I think there's, a, there's just a lesson here for us in how we talk about Jesus to the people around us. we talk about Jesus to those that, that aren't followers of him, that don't yet know him, do we talk about Jesus in just some, some surface level stuff? Just some, 
superficial stuff? Or do we talk about who he really is? And what he has, he has really done? How he has changed our hearts? How he has called us to himself? And changed us, given us a, a, a new heart? Do, do we, when we talk about Jesus, how do we talk about him? Because somebody talked to this centurion, and I think he knows about who Jesus really is. And as we, the story has unfolded, as we've looked at this story, there's just something different about this man. And I think the difference is that he knows who Jesus is. He knows and he believes in Jesus. Let's look at our last two verses. We can see how Jesus responds to him. Verse 9 and 10, it says, When Jesus heard these things, he, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So how does Jesus respond? He says he marveled. I love that. He marveled at this man, a man who he actually never physically met. Get that. He never met him. First time he sent Jewish elders because he didn't want to go. Next time he sent friends, right, because he, didn't, he couldn't go. But Jesus marvels at this man that he had never met. See, nowhere in this passage do we see that, that he meets Jesus. He doesn't talk face to face with him. But still Jesus marvels at him. So the only other time, you can look in, in Scripture as well, the only time that I, that we get, that I could find in, 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 the, in the ESV translation of the Bible where it had that word marvel, there is one other time where Jesus marveled at something. And it wasn't faith. In Mark 6, 6, he marvels at unbelief. He marveled at, at a group for how, that they did not believe. This is the only time in Scripture where Jesus marveled at someone's faith. And it's a Gentile. It's not a Jew. It's a Gentile. It's a, it's a soldier that, that never actually met up with Jesus. He marvels at them. So he, and he tells the crowd around him, right? There's a crowd that's gathering that came with him. We, we talked about that already. He says, you know, not in all of Israel have I seen such faith. Imagine that statement, Right? Imagine, that's, and it's an amazing statement, right? Here's a man who, who grew up, who did not grow up likely with the Old Testament scriptures. Yet he knew without a doubt who Jesus was, what he could do. That Jesus could do the impossible, could, could heal with just a word. So Jesus marveled at that faith. And he commends that faith in front of this crowd, right? The crowd that, that had those Jewish elders that were there. He's basically saying, man, he's way, he's got way more faith than you guys have. He said that statement probably to his disciples that were there gathering around. They, they heard this too. I right? just recorded here. So I, the disciples, at least a few of them, were, were there, the apostles. He's saying, not in all of Israel have I found such faith. I guess I wish I had more time to go into this statement. But even in this statement, Jesus is saying that even, even a Gentile can be saved. Right? He's, it's opening up. Right? It's not just for Jews. But this faith now can be given to Gentiles. Then in the end, we see that, that they return back and the servant has been healed. See, the centurion knew who Jesus was. And he knew that there was only one person that was worthy of anything, and he knew it wasn't him. And as we look at what it means to be, to be worthy and, and how we define this word, right? The Jews believed, right, that that they were worthy because of what they did. And so was the centurion, right? All because of their, their deeds. But church, we need to make sure that we know where our worth comes from and where our worthiness comes from. And as I, as I was prepping, you just see this clear distinction between what religion tells us and what the gospel tells us. 
See, the way the elders thought was this very religious mindset. Religion is all about doing, right? It's doing enough to earn favor with God, doing enough good deeds. It's all based on how good I am, how many good things that I do. If I do enough good things, I can earn my way to heaven. That's, that's a religious mindset. But the gospel, and that is the good news of what Jesus has done, that Jesus came to earth, right? He condescended from heaven, came to earth. And he died in our place for the death that we deserve. We're told that we deserve death for our sin. We've all sinned. And because of that, that sin that we have, we deserve death. But Jesus came and lived a perfect, sinless life and paid the punishment. He died the death that we deserved. Right? Because of that death, for all who who repent and all who believe, they can become righteous before God. That's the good news of the gospel. The gospel tells us, you know, it's not based on what we do. Because what we do is, is, is sin. That's, that's what we do. We don't do enough. But the gospel tells us it's not based on what we do, but solely on what Jesus has done. Everything that he has done gets transferred to us when we repent and we believe on the gospel. Religion says, you know, obey. Right? I obey so God will accept me. That's the only reason I obey. But the gospel says that we are accepted because of what Jesus has done. Not not because of obedience. But it's because of that acceptance that we obey. Right? So we obey out of love. We obey Jesus. We read our scriptures. We gather with other believers. We give. We do all these things out of love, not to get something in return. Religion says that our identity is based on our works. Right? But the gospel tells us that our identity is centered in and on Jesus and how he sees us. See, all that we hear from religion is do. Do this and you can get this. But what the gospel says isn't do. The gospel says done. It's done. See, the gospel of Jesus is not about following a list of duties. It's about getting to know Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us. And as followers of Jesus, we have come to realize that we are far more broken than we really know. But in and through the person of Jesus, we are far more accepted than we can ever imagine. So that's such good news. And so may our words just echo that of the centurion. Lord, I am not worthy. And yet just as Jesus healed the centurion with with just a word, he has also healed our sinful hearts with his gospel word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for this passage and just how it points us to us or how it points us to you. It doesn't point it to, to us and to our work, but it just points us to what you have done and just the good news of the gospel. So we're so grateful to it, God. Would we just treasure this? Would we be reminded of this, this, this amazing news this week? Just thank you for it. Thank you for this good news and what you have done. Amen.